This is Rob Tubbett for Boxing Social in association with Betfred. Delighted to be joined once again by legendary sports writer Thomas Hauser. We're here in Las Vegas ahead of Canelo Alvarez's WBO light heavyweight title challenge of Sergei Kovalev. How are you doing, Thomas? I'm good. It's nice to be here and nice to be sitting with you again. Thank you very much. It is nice to be here and nice to be sitting here with you too. Um, so, we're here in Las Vegas ahead of Canelo versus Kovalev. Talk to me about the fight. I like this fight a lot. It's a very interesting fight. The question is, did Canelo bite off more than he can chew? We'll find out the answer on Saturday night. And one of the things that's particularly intriguing to me about this fight is that if Canelo wins, and I think he will, but if Canelo wins, my sense is that he really deserves to be the fighter of the decade. If you look at what Canelo has accomplished in this decade, he has ducked nobody. He's fought everybody who was put in front of him. He has one loss to Floyd Mayweather at a point in time when he just wasn't old enough and mature enough to, to deal with that. Floyd got him before Canelo matured as a fighter. And other than that, he's got quite a few names on his resume. And if you look at the competition, Andre Ward, great fighter. But most of his biggest wins were in the previous decade. Floyd Mayweather, Manny Pacquiao, Vladimir Klitschko, most of their big wins were in the previous decade. Fighters like uh, uh, you know, Terence Crawford, Errol Spence, Vasyl Lomachenko, you know, the big names today really have only had a few years with no real signature wins on their resume. You know, beating Sean Porter isn't a signature win. You know, beating Jorge Linares is not a signature win. So my belief is that if Canelo wins this fight on Saturday night, he should be the fighter of the decade. That's quite an honor. It certainly is. Um, one of the, th the themes that has been kind of around fight week this week has been Canelo's kind of quest for greatness and where it would leave him in the pantheon of, of all-time great Mexican fighters. Should he emerge victorious on Saturday and become a well, light heavyweight champion, having started his career as I believe as a welterweight, where do you believe that would put him among your Salvador Sanchez's, Julio Cesar Chavez's, etc.? You really can't put Canelo in the context of history until his career is over. That's the time to really sit down and look. If somebody had looked at Mike Tyson after he fought Michael Spinks, you would have said, that might be the greatest heavyweight of all time, and then everything fell apart. Now, for me, one of the sad things about Mike is that the craziness and dissolution at the end has obscured how great a fighter he was when he was young. But you really have to look at people in the context of a whole career. What I will say about Canelo now is when he says he wants to fight the best, he really means it. He goes in tough. You have a lot of people who talk big and then either hide behind their promoter or their TV network or whatever. Canelo really seeks out the inquisitors. I give him a lot of credit for that. And it makes him a better fighter. You know, you become a great fighter by fighting other elite fighters. He has done that, and he's turned each of these fights into a learning experience. So it's too early to tell where he ranks in history with people like Julio Cesar Chavez and Salvador Sanchez, but he could be at or very near the top by the time he's done. And the Mexican people are starting to understand that too. At the beginning, there was a sense, well, yeah, he, he, he's from Mexico and he has red hair, but there's a lot of hype. And no, now people are understanding that Canelo is a warrior. He loves to fight. There's nothing ambivalent about his approach to the game. That's all to his credit. You mentioned Mike Tyson there. We're going to go a little bit off the beaten track uh, now, which I like to do when I speak to you. Um, you obviously had a, a very well-documented, extensive relationship with the late, great Muhammad Ali. How much of a relationship, or, or if any, did you have with Mike Tyson? I actually met Mike Tyson for the first time in October of 1983 when he was 17 years old. He hadn't even turned pro yet. I had just started researching my first book about boxing, The Black Lights. Literally, the first two people I interviewed were Bill Caton and Jim Jacobs. They said to me, 
if you are going to write about boxing, you have to meet Customato. And they arranged for me to spend a week in the farm, I'm sorry, a weekend in the farmhouse in Catskill where Cuss was living with some young boxers, including Mike Tyson. So I spent a weekend with Cuss and Mike Tyson and a few others at that point in time. And he certainly has evolved a lot and come a long way since then. He certainly has. Um, it's interesting that you say you met him at that point in his life. What was he like then? I mean, as I understand it, under Cuss, he was certainly a different person as he would later turn into. What was your, your kind of early the, memories of him? The mythology that was being spread at the time was that not only was this going to be the greatest heavyweight champion of all time, but Cuss had turned, into, into, turned Mike into a sweet, nice model citizen, and that was not the case. Uh, my sense that Mike Tyson has been evolving as a person, and I give him a lot of credit over the years for trying hard to make himself into a better person, but the 17-year-old Mike Tyson that I met was a very angry, hostile young man. I don't mean that he was rude to me, he wasn't, but I mean, but, but you could see the, the rage and the anger and hostility inside him and as he became more and more prominent and wealthy and famous there were no checks on that so for a long time things got worse before they got better. And is that something you could you could see in him then? Is it something that you kind of preempted that would rear its head later on in his career in his life? A absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I watched him in the gym one day and I didn't know a whole lot about boxing at the time, but when the, he hit the heavy bag, you know, it was, oh my God, you know, this is scary, especially in a 17-year-old. And of course, he had the body of a grown man. He had man strength at age 17. Uh, but there were a lot of difficult personal issues. And look, if, if you or I came out of the environment that Mike Tyson came out of, you know, we'd have more issues than we do now. I think that's fair to say, yeah. Um, talk to me about Las Vegas. So I spoke to you in New York ahead of Anthony Joshua versus Andy Ruiz. I asked you when the first time you ever went to Madison Square Garden was. When was the first time you made it out to Las Vegas for a fight, if you can remember? I, I honestly don't remember with certainty the first time I came out here for a fight. Probably would have been about 20 years ago. Uh, one of the things that I've noted is that in the past, when there was a big fight in Las Vegas, it took over the whole town, or the whole city, if you will, and there was a real buzz for it everywhere. And I don't sense that here this weekend. This is a big fight. This is a credible fight. This is an important fight. But for most of the big fights I've been to in Las Vegas lately, you haven't had that buzz. It isn't taking over the city. Uh, you had Tyson Fury fought recently in T-Mobile, and they gave away more tickets than they sold, and they still only had about 8,000 people there. So boxing has some work to do here to recapture the position that it once had. Why do you think that is, Thomas? Why do you think that there's been this... this why, why do you think that we're here in Las Vegas and you're saying these things now? Look, boxing has problems, that's no secret. First, there's obviously a lot of competition from other sports. In, in boxing's case now, certainly MMA and UFC have taken away some of boxing's thunder in, in terms of you know, bringing in high rollers to casinos and the like. And the other thing is boxing keeps shooting itself in the foot. And I say it again and again and again, that one of the things that's really killing boxing now is that you don't have recognizable champions. We're sitting here in the MGM Grand, and it's Wednesday afternoon, and tonight the Houston Astros and Washington Nationals are going to play in the seventh game of the World Series, and then we will have a World Series champion. We won't have an American League World Series champion and a National League World Series champion. We won't have four World Cup winners in soccer. You know, it's just boxing does that to itself. Right here in Las Vegas, if we walked out into the casino and said, who is the heavyweight champion of the world? 
the answer we would get most is, well, I don't think it's Mike Tyson anymore. There are very few people in this casino right now who would say, well, Deontay Wilder has the WBC belt, and Andy Ruiz has those belts, and Tyson Fury says he's the lineal champion. It is killing the sport. I don't mind all the weight divisions. I think that's good for the sport and good for the health and safety of fighters. But I hate it when we have four champions in a, each weight division, and then on top of they pile in interim champions and super champions and franchise champions. It has devalued the meaning of the word champion. That to me is doing more to hurt boxing than anything else. And it's being you know, made worse by the fact now that you don't see the fights you want to see. In the old days, HBO would have had Terence Crawford and Errol Spence on the same fight card against relatively easy opponents. And then in their next fight, they would have fought each other. Now you have guys who hide behind their TV networks. They hide behind their pro promoters. Now, in that case, I think Terence really wants the fight. And I think Bob Arum has come around to wanting the fight. But I'm not so sure Errol wants it, and Al Heyman certainly doesn't. So all this huge money that's coming into boxing now from DAZN, from ESPN, from Fox, is being used to keep the big fights from happening rather than making the big fights. I'd just like to pick up on something that you said there about um, Tyson Fury being the lineal heavyweight champion of the world. It's something that in some sections of, of boxing fans' minds is it's not given that much respect I, by certain... To me, it's nonsense. To me, it's nonsense because the, you say the lineal... The line goes back to when? I mean, yeah, you can say it goes back to John L. Sullivan, but it doesn't. Gene Tunney retired as heavyweight champion of the world. End of line. The line's over. Rocky Marciano retired is unbeaten heavyweight champion of the world. End of line. The line is over. Lennox Lewis retired as heavyweight champion of the world. End of line. Line is over. Now, where that comes from in terms of Tyson Fury is over time Vladimir Klitschko, who had lost three times previously, established himself legitimately as the heavyweight champion of the world. He didn't beat a lot of elite fighters to get there because there wasn't much out there, but people started to think, okay, Vladimir is the heavyweight champion. But that doesn't mean you're the lineal champion if you beat Vladimir. And you really, except for occasional marketing nonsense, we don't talk about the lineal middleweight champion of the world, the lineal welterweight champion of the world. Tyson Fury is a belt holder now, and that's like the, what, the Ring Magazine belt? Is that what he has? Or a mythological lineal belt? But Tyson Fury can say he's heavyweight champion. Deontay Wilder can say it. Andy Ruiz can say it, although after December 7th, you know, maybe Anthony Joshua can say it again. Right now, as far as I'm concerned, there is no heavyweight champion of the world. And that's a real shame for boxing, because the heavyweight championship of the world used to be the most coveted title in sports. When I say world heavyweight champion, apart from Muhammad Ali, who I know you had an extensive relationship with and spent a lot of time with, what name springs to mind for you? Yeah. To me, Joe Lewis, for starters. To, uh, and to my way of thinking, Muhammad Ali was probably the greatest heavyweight fighter ever. But I wouldn't argue if you said that Joe Lewis was boxing's greatest heavyweight champion. What he did for this country and for the world, I don't think will ever be matched again. And yes, Ali was very important. He really was. But when Joe Lewis got in the ring and defeated Max Schmeling in their rematch in 1938. It was the first time that a lot of people ever heard a black man referred to simply as the American, the American champion. Jack Johnson was also enormously important. So in terms of social, political influence, I'd say that Ali Joe Lewis and Jack Johnson are the three most important. Probably Lewis won Alley two and Jack Johnson three, but they all had enormously important social influence. Then you have people like Jack Dempsey and John L. Sullivan before him, who elevated the heavyweight championship to a whole new 
level in terms of public acclaim. And you also have great fighters like Larry Holmes, George Foreman, Joe Frazier, who brought honor to the sport, were incredibly gifted in the ring. Lennox Lewis, who was a man of wonderful elegance and grace outside the ring and carried himself like a champion inside it as well. So yeah, when boxing has a legitimate heavyweight champion that we can point to and say, yeah, he's the guy, that's very special for the sport. And there were times when, when you didn't have all these nonsense belts, where even when the heavyweight champion was somebody like James Braddock, you could look and people could say, yeah, he might not be the best heavyweight in the world right now, but he is the heavyweight champion of the world. We don't have that anymore, and that's a shame. We mentioned Anthony Joshua versus Andrew Ruiz. The last time I saw you was in New York. Um, we're now, I think, six weeks away or, or something like that from the, from the rematch. I spoke to you in the immediate aftermath of that fight um, and you were very critical of Anthony Joshua's performance. Do you see a repeat? Do you see Anthony Joshua being able to make the required changes in time for that rematch? This is a very, very tough fight to call. If I had to pick a winner of Ruiz Joshua II, I would pick Anthony. But I say that without a lot of conviction. And yeah, I understand that guys can get caught which happened to him in the third round, and it takes him out of the fight, and, and they're done. They can't come back from that. What troubled me most about Anthony's performance in the first fight against Andy Ruiz were the first two rounds, where Andy was backing Anthony up. You had this short guy, you know, we thought like a pudgy, out of shape, ha, 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 you know, who is backing the heavyweight champion you know, up, without really throwing much of anything, and yet he, he, he just seemed to have control of the ring. That troubles me in terms of what happens in the future. And look, I'm sure Anthony is going to use his jab or try to use his jab much more aggressively this time, more effectively. As I said, if I had to pick a winner, I'd pick Anthony, my sense is that this is much more likely to go like Lennox Lewis against Tassim Rockman number two than the first go round. But I don't know. That's what makes it such an intriguing fight. And we all sort of lucked into it, didn't we? Because there were very few people who thought that Joshua Ruiz one was going to be a competitive fight. I know I got a lot of credit uh, from the media because I was interviewed uh, by a few people before and I, I had the line, I said, you know, Mark Twain once said that Wagner's music is better than it sounds and Andy Ruiz is a better fighter than he looks. But was I picking Andy Ruiz? No. I thought Anthony Joshua was going to win that fight. And let's be honest about it. Most people you know, thought Anthony was going to win that fight and there wasn't a lot of doubt in their minds. We've spoken about Mike Tyson and kind of the way his career went. Um, it's not the same thing, but I mean, when Buster Douglas won the World Heavyweight title, there was a dip. Obviously, he put weight on for the Holyfield fight and ended up losing his title. We've seen Andy Ruiz out, let's say, enjoying life as heavyweight champion. Is that just part and parcel of being a fighter, capturing the greatest prize in the sport? Does that, is that not inevitable, but does that happen more often than you would think? No, it's up to the fighter. You know, Bernard Hopkins won fights and didn't go out and dissolute uh, that. I, I used that word in the wrong tense, but I mean, he, 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 Bernard, you know, still wouldn't eat a cupcake the night after the fight because he wasn't putting sugar in his body. There are fighters who take their training very, very seriously and don't let their bodies fall apart. Uh, it's hard, especially in the case of somebody like Andy, who's never really taken conditions conditioning seriously. He has this huge win. He has all this money, all this attention. We won't know until fight night the degree to which that has affected him. Back to this fight, um, Canelo versus Kovalev. Canelo jumping up to 175 pounds. We've spoken on several instances in the past about performance enhancing drugs in the sport. Um, it seems to me that a lot of talk coming into this week has been about whether or not Canelo Alvarez may or may not be in use of performance enhancing drugs jumping up to 175 pounds. I know you're a huge advocate of VADA testing and Canelo being enrolled in year-round testing. In modern-day boxing, when doping in the sport is so prevalent, is it unrealistic to expect that Canelo is clean going into this fight? No, I believe that Canelo is clean. 
Now, we all understand that he tested positive once for clenbuterol, and I've spoken with Margaret Goodman at length about that, and she said that the, in that particular case, the amounts found in Canelo's system were consistent with inadvertently eating tainted beef, but Canelo said, look, it was in my system. He took responsibility for it. He served his punishment. But Margaret Goodman, who runs VADA, which to me is not just the most credible PED testing organization in boxing, but the only credible PED testing organization in boxing right now, said that she has never had a fighter who was more helpful and compliant than Canelo. He has never missed a test. He has given every blood and urine sample that has been asked of him. Nobody has ever been tested as often by VADA. And so I believe Canelo is entitled to the belief that, that, that he is clean for this fight until somebody shows me something otherwise. Uh, I, he's an honest fighter in the ring, and I think he's an honest fighter outside it. That's my personal belief. In your opinion, um, should somebody subject themselves to extensive VADA testing over a period of time of, say, 12 to 14 weeks? Is that infallible? Is that then impossible to cheat no. the system? No testing system, particularly in today's world of microdosing, is infallible. You can have somebody who tests completely clean one day, and then if you went back and ran the same test the next day, the fighter might turn up dirty. Jarrell Miller, we all know, flunked three VADA tests. He passed one VADA test because the stuff just wasn't in his system that day. So no, Margaret would be the first person to say VADA testing is not infallible, but it increases the chances of catching the cheats. And also with Margaret, you get honest results. She doesn't you know, give TUEs, she doesn't bury anything. If she gets a positive test result, she reports it to the promoter, the governing state athletic commission, both fighters' camps. That's the way it should be done. Boxing also is home to several coaches, SNC coaches if you would call them that, who have been banned from other sports but found themselves in boxing. Um, a quote that I was attributed to Victor Conte, um, boxing is the wild west of sports. The only reason I work in boxing is because nobody else would hire me. Is that a concern to you that people are, are leaving other sports or being banned from other sports and ending up in boxing? Well, some of the people who are in boxing today as conditioners do concern me. Not Victor. We all know what Victor did. Victor admitted to what he did. And I honestly believe now that Victor Conti is a force for reform and good in boxing. And he is very generous in making his knowledge regarding performance enhancing drugs to state athletic commissions, to other testers. He's a wonderful resource for the sport, as I believe Margaret Goodman is. But there are other people who work with fighters who don't have that same mindset, who are looking to beat the system. There are gyms and people in boxing know who, where they are, you know, that, that are centers for performance enhancing drug distribution. By and large, the state athletic commissions turn a blind eye. If something's thrown in their face, they deal with it, but they're not seriously interested in performance enhancing drug testing. Either it's too expensive, or they don't want to scare away the big fights, or they don't know what they're doing. And at the end of the day, it's going to have to be the fighters who step up and say, hey, we're the guys who are getting hit in the head harder. And Julian Williams did that, I guess, re I guess recently, where he said, if you want to fight me, you have to enroll for VADA testing and do it early on. And that, to me, is the smart thing to do because, again, the fighters are the ones who are getting hit in the head harder. And that's not good for you. Final question on kind of doping in the sport. I mean, we saw four failed tests in, I think, six days not too long ago. Um, what does the sport have to do? I mean, you just mentioned about fighters. I know me and you have spoken in the past about broadcasters potentially having their opinion or having their say and making a statement. Is that realistic? If not, what, what do you believe should be done in the sport? Al Heyman, Showtime and Fox. Matchroom, Golden Boy and DAZN. Top rank ESPN and Queensberry should all say, if you want to fight on our networks, if you want to fight on our fight cards, 
you have to sign up for VADA testing 365 days a year. Now, it can't happen in a vacuum because if one network does that, they're likely to lose some fighters to other networks. The same way if, if one state athletic commission gets really tough on PEDs, I'm not talking about show, they're going to lose some fights to other jurisdictions. It has to be a joint effort. And let's face it, the money now is coming from the TV networks. If the TV networks said to the promoters, this is the way it's going to be from now on, and all the big TV networks did it, so you know you, they didn't risk losing fighters to other networks, that would go a long way to, towards cleaning up the sport. And just finally, of course, we were saddened to, to lose Patrick Day recently, Maxim Dadashev, who of course works worked with um, Buddy McGirt. <clears throat> it seems to me this is, has been the worst year, I believe, in 100 years in boxing for deaths in the ring. Is that...? No, I am sure that there are years where more than, than four or five people were killed in the ring. Uh, I mean, you have to go back and look at stats, but first, there's been a lot more boxing in other times. These things are much better recorded now. It's an ongoing problem. You need better health and safety standards across the board, not just with PEDs, but with preliminary to test testing, determining who should be in the ring, with training referees and ring doctors to know what they're looking for. And let's also remember that it's not just the fighters who were killed. Magomed Abdusalamov is still alive, and his life is an ongoing tragedy. That's well said. Um, okay, well... Oh, sorry. We have to wrap it up. Yeah, sure. I was just about to say, Thomas Howes, it's always a pleasure catching up with you. I can't believe we've sat here for this long, um, but I could listen to, speak, uh, listen to you talk all day. Thanks very much for speaking to Boxing Social. Thank you so for sure. having me. Maybe we'll do it again after the fight. Hopefully so. Thanks very much, Thomas. Thank you, sir.